Chapter twenty five of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen eighty seven, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter twenty five. The personality of Edith Leet had naturally impressed me strongly, ever since I had come, in so strange a manner, to be an inmate of her father's house, and it was to be expected that after what had happened the night previous I should be more than ever preoccupied with thoughts of her. From the first I had been struck with the air of serene frankness and ingenuous directness, more like that of a noble and innocent boy than any girl I had ever known, which characterized her. I was curious to know how far this charming quality might be peculiar to herself, and how far possibly a result of alterations in the social position of women which might have taken place since my time. Finding an opportunity that day, when alone with Dr. Leete, I turned the conversation in that direction. "'I suppose,' I said, "'that women nowadays, having been relieved of the burden of housework, have no employment but the cultivation of their charms and graces.' "'So far as we men are concerned,' replied Dr. Leete, "'we should consider that they amply paid their way, to use one of your forms of expression, if they confined themselves to that occupation. But you may be very sure that they have quite too much spirit to consent to be mere beneficiaries of society, even as a return for ornamenting it. They did, indeed, welcome their riddance from housework, because that was not only exceptionally wearing in itself, but also wasteful in the extreme of energy, as compared with the cooperative plan. But they accepted relief from that sort of work only that they might contribute in other and more effectual, as well as more agreeable, ways to the common weal. Our women, as well as our men, are members of the industrial army, and leave it only when maternal duties claim them. The result is that most women, at one time or another of their lives, serve industrially some five or ten or fifteen years, while those who have no children fill out the full term. "'A woman does not, then, necessarily leave the industrial service on marriage?' I queried. "'No more than a man,' replied the doctor. "'Why on earth should she? Married women have no housekeeping responsibilities now, you know, and a husband is not a baby that he should be cared for. It was thought one of the most grievous features of our civilization that we required so much toil from women, I said, but it seems to me you get more out of them than we did. Dr. Leed laughed. Indeed we do, just as we do out of our men. Yet the women of this age are very happy, and those of the nineteenth century, unless contemporary references greatly mislead us, were very miserable. The reason that women nowadays are so much more efficient co-laborers with the men, and at the same time are so happy, is that, in regard to their work as well as men's, we follow the principle of providing every one the kind of occupation he or she is best adapted to. Women being inferior in strength to men, and further disqualified industrially in special ways, the kinds of occupations reserved for them, and the conditions under which they pursue them, have reference to these facts. The heavier sorts of work are everywhere reserved for men, the lighter occupations for women. Under no circumstances is a woman permitted to follow any employment not perfectly adapted, both as to kind and degree of labor, to her sex. Moreover, the hours of women's work are considerably shorter than those of men's, more frequent vacations are granted, and the most careful provision is made for rest when needed. The men of this day so well appreciate that they owe to the beauty and grace of women the chief zest of their lives and their main incentive to effort, that they permit them to work at all only because it is fully understood that a certain regular requirement of labor, of a sort adapted to their powers, is well for body and mind during the period of maximum physical vigor. We believe that the magnificent health which distinguishes our women from those of your day who seem to have been so generally sickly, is owing largely to the fact that all alike are furnished with healthful and inspiriting occupation. "'I understood you,' I said, "'that the women workers belong to the army of industry. But how can they be under the same system of ranking and discipline with the men, when the conditions of their labor are so different?' "'They are under an entirely different discipline,' replied Dr. Leete. 
and constitute rather an allied force than an integral part of the army of the men. They have a woman general-in-chief, and are under exclusively feminine regime. This general, as also the higher officers, is chosen by the body of women who have passed the time of service, in correspondence with the manner in which the chiefs of the masculine army and the president of the nation are elected. The general of the women's army sits in the cabinet of the president, and has a veto on measures respecting women's work, pending appeals to Congress. I should have said, in speaking of the judiciary, that we have women on the bench, appointed by the general of the women, as well as men. Causes in which both parties are women are determined by women judges, and where a man and a woman are parties to a case, a judge of either sex must consent to the verdict. Womanhood seems to be organized as a sort of imperium in imperio in your system, I said. To some extent, Dr. Leeds replied, but the inner imperium is one from which you will admit there is not likely to be much danger to the nation. The lack of some such recognition of the distinct individuality of the sexes was one of the innumerable defects of your society. The passional attraction between men and women has too often prevented a perception of the profound differences which make the members of each sex in many things strange to the other, and capable of sympathy only with their own. It is in giving full play to the differences of sex, rather than in seeking to obliterate them, as was apparently the effort of some reformers in your day, that the enjoyment of each by itself, and the piquancy which each has for the other, are alike enhanced. In your day there was no career for women except in an unnatural rivalry with men. We have given them a world of their own, with its emulations, ambitions, and careers, and I assure you they are very happy in it. It seems to us that women were more than any other class the victims of your civilization. There is something which, even at this distance of time, penetrates one with pathos in the spectacle of their annoyed, undeveloped lives, stunted at marriage, their narrow horizon, bounded so often, physically, by the four walls of home, and morally, by a petty circle of personal interests. I speak now not of the poorer classes, who were generally worked to death, but also of the well-to-do and rich. From the great sorrows, as well as the petty frets of life, they had no refuge in the breezy outdoor world of human affairs, nor any interests save those of the family. Such an existence would have softened men's brains or driven them mad. All that is changed today. No woman is heard nowadays wishing she were a man, nor parents desiring boy rather than girl children. Our girls are as full of ambition for their careers as our boys. Marriage, when it comes, does not mean incarceration for them, nor does it separate them in any way from the larger interests of society, the bustling life of the world. Only when maternity fills a woman's mind with new interests does she withdraw from the world for a time. Afterward, and at any time, she may return to her place among her comrades, nor need she ever lose touch with them. Women are a very happy race nowadays, as compared with what they ever were before in the world's history, and their power of giving happiness to men has been, of course, increased in proportion. I should imagine it possible, I said, that the interest which girls take in their careers as members of the industrial army and candidates for its distinctions might have an effect to deter them from marriage. Dr. Leed smiled. Have no anxiety on that score, Mr. West, he replied. The Creator took very good care that whatever other modifications the dispositions of men and women might with time take on, their attraction for each other should remain constant. The mere fact that in an age like yours, when the struggle for existence must have left people little time for other thoughts, and the future was so uncertain that to assume parental responsibilities must have often seemed like a criminal risk, there was even then marrying and giving in marriage, should be conclusive on this point. As for love nowadays, one of our authors says that the vacuum left in the minds of men and women by the absence of care for one's livelihood has been entirely taken up by the tender passion. That, however, I beg you to believe, is something of an exaggeration. For the rest, 
so far is marriage from being an interference with a woman's career that the higher positions in the feminine army of industry are entrusted only to women who have been both wives and mothers, as they alone fully represent their sex. Are credit cards issued to the women just as to the men? Certainly. The credits of the women, I suppose, are for smaller sums, owing to the frequent suspension of their labour on account of family responsibilities. Smaller? exclaimed Dr. Leed. Oh, no! The maintenance of all our people is the same. There are no exceptions to that rule. But if any difference were made on account of the interruptions you speak of, it would be by making the woman's credit larger, not smaller. Can you think of any service constituting a stronger claim on the nation's gratitude than bearing and nursing the nation's children? According to our view, none deserve so well of the world as good parents. There is no task so unselfish, so necessarily without return, though the heart is well rewarded, as the nurture of the children who are to make the world for one another when we are gone. It would seem to follow, from what you have said, that wives are in no way dependent on their husbands for maintenance. Of course they are not, replied Dr. Leed, nor children on their parents either, that is, for means of support, though of course they are for the offices of affection. The child's labour, when he grows up, will go to increase the common stock, not his parents, who will be dead, and therefore he is properly nurtured out of the common stock. The account of every person, man, woman, and child, you must understand, is always with the nation directly, and never through any intermediary, except, of course, that parents, to a certain extent, act for children as their guardians. You see that it is by virtue of the relation of individuals to the nation, of their membership in it, that they are entitled to support, and this title is in no way connected with or affected by their relations to other individuals who are fellow members of the nation with them. That any person should be dependent for the means of support upon another would be shocking to the moral sense as well as indefensible on any rational social theory. What would become of personal liberty and dignity under such an arrangement? I am aware that you called yourselves free in the nineteenth century. The meaning of the word could not then, however, have been at all what it is at present, or you certainly would not have applied it to a society of which nearly every member was in a position of galling personal dependence upon others as to the very means of life, the poor upon the rich, or employed upon employer, women upon men, children upon parents. Instead of distributing the product of the nation directly to its members, which would seem the most natural and obvious method, it would actually appear that you had given your minds to devising a plan of hand-to-hand -hand distribution, involving the maximum of personal humiliation to all classes of recipients. As regards the dependence of women upon men for support, which then was usual, of course, natural attraction in case of marriages of love may often have made it endurable, though for spirited women I should fancy it must always have remained humiliating. What, then, must it have been in the innumerable cases where women, with or without the form of marriage, had to sell themselves to men to get their living? Even your contemporaries, callous as they were to most of the revolting aspects of their society, seem to have had an idea that this was not quite as it should be. But it was still only for pity's sake that they deplored the lot of the women. It did not occur to them that it was robbery as well as cruelty, when men seized for themselves the whole product of the world and left women to beg and wheedle for their share. Why, but bless me, Mr. West, I'm really running on at a remarkable rate, just as if the robbery, the sorrow, and the shame which those poor women endured were not over a century since, or as if you were responsible for what you no doubt deplored as much as I do. I must bear my share of responsibility for the world as it then was, I replied. All I can say in extenuation is that until the nation was ripe for the present system of organized production and distribution, no radical improvement in the position of woman was possible. The root of her disability, as you say, was a personal dependence upon men for her livelihood, and I can imagine no other mode of social organization than that you have adopted 
which would have set woman free of men at the same time that it set men free of one another. I suppose, by the way, that so entire a change in the position of women cannot have taken place without affecting in marked ways the social relations of the sexes. That will be a very interesting study for me. The change you will observe, said Dr. Leed, will chiefly be, I think, the entire frankness and unconstraint which now characterizes those relations, as compared with the artificiality which seems to have marked them in your time. The sexes now meet with the ease of perfect equals, suitors to each other for nothing but love. In your time, the fact that women were dependent for support on men made the woman, in reality, the one chiefly benefited by marriage. This fact, so far as we can judge from contemporary records, appears to have been coarsely enough recognized among the lower classes, while among the more polished it was glossed over by a system of elaborate conventionalities which aimed to carry the precisely opposite meaning, namely that the man was the party chiefly benefited. To keep up this convention it was essential that he should always seem the suitor. Nothing was therefore considered more shocking to the proprieties than that a woman should betray a fondness for a man before he had indicated a desire to marry her. Why, we actually have in our libraries books by authors of your day written for no other purpose than to discuss the question whether, under any conceivable circumstances, a woman might, without discredit to her sex, reveal an unsolicited love. All this seems exquisitely absurd to us, and yet we know that, given your circumstances, the problem might have a serious side. When for a woman to proffer her love to a man was in effect to invite him to assume the burden of her support, it is easy to see that pride and delicacy might well have checked the promptings of the heart. When you go out into our society, Mr. West, you must be prepared to be often cross-questioned on this point by our young people, who are naturally much interested in this aspect of old-fashioned manners. Footnote I may say that Dr. Leed's warning has been fully justified by my experience. The amount and intensity of amusement which the young people of this day, and the young women especially, are able to extract from what they are pleased to call the oddities of courtship in the nineteenth century, appear unlimited. End footnote. And so the girls of the twentieth century tell their love. If they choose, replied Dr. Leed, there is no more pretense of a concealment of feeling on their part than on the part of their lovers. Coquetry would be as much despised in a girl as in a man. Affected coldness, which in your day rarely deceived a lover, would deceive him wholly now, for no one thinks of practising it. One result which must follow from the independence of women I can see for myself, I said. There can be no marriages now except those of inclination. That is a matter of course, replied Dr. Leed. Think of a world in which there are nothing but matches of pure love. Ah, me, Dr. Leed, how far you are from being able to understand what an astonishing phenomenon such a world seems to a man of the nineteenth century. I can, however, to some extent imagine it, replied the doctor. But the fact you celebrate that there are nothing but love matches means even more, perhaps, than you probably at first realize. It means that for the first time in human history the principle of sexual selection, with its tendency to preserve and transmit the better types of the race, and let the inferior types drop out, has unhindered operation. The necessities of poverty, the need of having a home, no longer tempt women to accept as the fathers of their children men whom they neither can love nor respect. Wealth and rank no longer divert attention from personal qualities. Gold no longer gilds the straitened forehead of the fool. The gifts of person, mind and disposition, beauty, wit, eloquence, kindness, generosity, geniality, courage, are sure of transmission to posterity. Every generation is sifted through a little finer mesh than the last, the attributes that human nature admires are preserved, those that repel it are left behind. There are, of course, a great many women who with love must mingle admiration and seek to wed greatly, but these not the less obey the same law, 
for to wed greatly now is not to marry men of fortune or title, but those who have risen above their fellows by the solidity or brilliance of their services to humanity. These form nowadays the only aristocracy with which alliance is distinction. You were speaking, a day or two ago, of the physical superiority of our people to your contemporaries. Perhaps more important than any of the causes I mentioned then, as tending to race purification, has been the effect of untrammeled sexual selection upon the quality of two or three successive generations. I believe that when you have made a fuller study of our people, you will find in them not only a physical, but a mental and moral improvement. It would be strange if it were not so, for not only is one of the great laws of nature now freely working out the salvation of the race, but a profound moral sentiment has come to its support. Individualism, which in your day was the animating idea of society, not only was fatal to any vital sentiment of brotherhood and common interest among living men, but equally to any realization of the responsibility of the living for the generation to follow. Today this sense of responsibility, practically unrecognized in all previous ages, has become one of the great ethical ideas of the race, reinforcing, with an intense conviction of duty, the natural impulse to seek in marriage the best and noblest of the other sex. The result is that not all the encouragements and incentives of every sort which have provided to develop industry, talent, genius, excellence of whatever kind, are comparable in their effect on our young men with the fact that our women sit aloft as judges of the race and reserve themselves to reward the winners. Of all the whips and spurs and baits and prizes, there is none like the thought of the radiant faces which the laggards will find averted. Celibates nowadays are almost invariably men who have failed to acquit themselves creditably in the work of life. The woman must be a courageous one, with a very evil sort of courage, too, whom pity for one of these unfortunates should lead to defy the opinion of her generation, for otherwise she is free, so far as to accept him for a husband. I should add that, more exacting and difficult to resist than any other element in that opinion, she would find the sentiment of her own sex. Our women have risen to the full height of their responsibility as the wardens of the world to come, to whose keeping the keys of the future are confided. Their feeling of duty in this respect amounts to a sense of religious consecration. It is a cult in which they educate their daughters from childhood. After going to my room that night, I sat up late to read a romance of Berrien, handed me by Dr. Leed, the plot of which turned on a situation suggested by his last words concerning the modern view of parental responsibility. A similar situation would almost certainly have been treated by a nineteenth-century romancist so as to excite the morbid sympathy of the reader with the sentimental selfishness of the lovers and his resentment toward the unwritten law which they outraged. I need not describe, for who has not read Ruth Elton, how different is the course which Berrien takes, and with what tremendous effect he enforces the principle which he states. Over the unborn our power is that of God, and our responsibility like his toward us. As we acquit ourselves toward them, so let him deal with us. End of chapter 25